I'd now like to introduce our first uh, homegrown speaker, um, Christopher Warren. Chris is the Federal Secretary of the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance. As Federal Secretary, he's responsible for coordinating the industrial and professional campaigns of the organisation on issues to build a strong and independent media and entertainment sector. A journalist, Chris is also CEO of the Walkley Foundation for Journalistic Excellence and he is a media past president of the International Federation of Journalists. As a rule, governments like secrecy. And as a rule, journalists don't. A journalist's job is to inform the community about what's going on so that society can hold governments to account for the way they govern. And that's why the debate over WikiLeaks so often sounds like people talking across each other rather than with each other. As the trade union and professional organisation for the people who inform and entertain Australia and New Zealand, we speak proudly for journalists in that debate. Julian Assange is one of our members, as he's just said, he has been for several years, and that's one of the reasons that I'm here tonight. But I'd want to be here whether Julian was a member of ours or not, because this issue is about free speech and its companion in arms, freedom of the press. Right now we're seeing how critical that issue is as we see our friends and colleagues, first in Tunisia and now in Egypt, confront the challenges of reporting freely in a dictatorship, both from foreign journalists, and we've seen the bashing and attacks on several Australian journalists in Egypt, uh, Mark Corcoran from the ABC, John Lyons from The Australian, Dan Naylor from Al Jazeera, and Hamish MacDonald from The Ten Network, and also, of course, the many brave Egyptian and Tunisian journalists and journalists throughout that region who are standing up for the rights of a free press and a democratic society. Because what they're doing is about what it's always been about. It's about our right to see, to hear, to read stories that someone, somewhere, doesn't want us to know. Journalism has always been about that. The rest, as they say, is advertising. Laurie Oakes, whose work you will have seen either in the Herald Sun or on Channel 9, has been breaking important news stories for decades. And in December, Laurie won the top award available to Australian journalists, the Gold Walkley, for the most outstanding piece of journalism in the past year. He did so after he broadcast news stories based on leaks. Leaks about what was really going on in the Federal Labor Party leadership. He gave us two of the best stories of the year, thanks to the leaks he received. And he gets those leaks because he is trusted by his sources, who he has skillfully managed over his many years as a journalist. And apart from his own integrity, Laurie is trusted because, on this issue at least, journalists are trusted. Over the past two decades, about 25 Australian journalists have faced the risk of jail through court proceedings to uphold our important professional principle that we do not reveal a confidential source. Three of those journalists have actually ended up in jail. Consider the case here in Melbourne of Herald Sun journalists Michael Harvey and Gerard McManus, who were convicted and fined for contempt of court when they refused to name the source of one of their stories. The only people, in fact, convicted in connection with that particular offence. Michael's career as a political journalist has been hampered by the fact that he's now a convicted criminal and so was unable to get a visa to visit the United States when Kevin Rudd made a prime ministerial visit there. All this because Michael adhered proudly to his profession's code of ethics. As experiments with freedom of information often demonstrate, govern governments too often prefer to keep things to themselves and not just on matters of national security either. Here's a number to think about. When Australia's news organisations got together with the Media Alliance 
and sponsored an independent audit of free speech in Australia, we found more than 500 separate secrecy clauses on the statute books of state and federal governments. That's 500 areas in which governments can bluntly say to you, we don't have to tell you that, and it may well be a criminal offence for you to know that. Sure, some of these are legitimately to do with matters of national security, but it's, they're just as likely to be about matters are as arcane as wheat exports. Now, governments like to think that the public can't handle information, so it's their job to handle it on our behalf. But in a democracy, information is held by the government in trust on behalf of the people, and it is we, the people, who have the right to be informed. And the more important the information, the more important it is that we be informed. But then it's also abundantly clear that governments get more than a little bit irrational when it comes to leaks. Governments just don't like whistleblowers. Although, in many cases, some of our whistleblowers should be hailed as national heroes for what they've done. Can we forget Bundaberg-based hospital nurse Tony Hoffman, who was the person who went public with her allegation surrounding Surgeon Jayan Patel and undoubtedly saved lives as a result? Here in Australia, we fought hard for workable legislation that protects these brave men and women who risk their jobs and sometimes their liberty to bring us these important stories. Too often the response is a witch hunt of whistleblowers that aims to isolate them, denigrate them, take them to court. For their troubles, whistleblowers too often end up with a criminal record. Now the federal government has proposed new legislation to protect whistleblowers, but actions slowed in the past 12 months. As a result of the hung parliament and the intervention of independent MP Andrew Wilkie, our lobbying, lobbying has finally given us Commonwealth legislation that provides some protection for journalists, but only in the Commonwealth jurisdiction. And it's critical that all state governments extend this protection in all areas, including in the multitude of statutory investigatory bodies like the Office of Police Integrity here in Melbourne or the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Now, all of this tells us that there's a lot in the WikiLeaks story that we've seen before. Journalists bringing to light information and governments trying to stop them. But what makes WikiLeaks more complex than the run-of-the-mill press freedom issues that we normally confront is that it's a sign of the fundamental change to information and access to information that the internet has wrought. It's the failure to understand these changes that has led governments and even some journalists who should know better, frankly, to engage in what is a last century debate about whether Julian Assange is or is not a journalist. There are plenty of people who want to say that Julian Assange can't be a journalist, so he, can't, he should not be given the same protection as somebody like Laurie Oakes. Leaving aside the meaningless debate of who is or is not a journalist, too many of these people fail to understand what journalism is or how fast and profoundly it's changing. Over the past few months, I've been proud of the fact that the Australian journalism community has shown that it does get it. In December, virtually every newspaper editor in the country signed a petition to our government, coordinated by our union, recognising that as a media organisation, albeit a new kind of media organisation, WikiLeaks should be treated with the same respect as established traditional media. As Laurie Oakes himself says, whether it's a letterbox full of classified cables or a quarter of a million documents on a CD, the principle is the same. Unfortunately, within the United States media community, there hasn't been the same understanding. But in the American community, like in Australia, we have to adjust to this shift not stand on a claim to exclusive privileges from last century. Unfortunately, our government doesn't seem to get it either. Initially, they claimed WikiLeaks was illegal, 
and have since spent three months trying to climb down from that position. And now they're invoking some sort of claim to moral force. And frankly, I'm stuffed if I know what that phrase, moral force, means. <laughs> the argument seems to go like this. Denying people the right to know important information about world affairs is morally valid, but revealing that information is somehow morally wrong. Now, I'm here tonight as a journalist to offer my support and that of all the journalists in the Media Alliance to Julian Assange in his struggles. <laughs> the idea that WikiLeaks has somehow unthinkingly put information up for anyone to see is simply absurd. On the contrary, they've sought out and worked carefully with fellow media groups and professional journalists from around the world to ensure that information has been contextualised and sensitive information redacted from the documents. Much of this harm minimisation strategy was suggested by WikiLeaks itself, as New York Times editor-in-chief Bill Keller admitted last week. Keller also said, long before WikiLeaks was born, the internet transformed the landscape of journalism, creating a wide open and global market with easier access to audiences and sources, a quicker metabolism, a new infrastructure for sharing and vetting information, and a diminished respect for notions of privacy and secrecy. Newspapers have been publishing texts of documents almost as long as newspapers have existed. And ever since the internet eliminated space restrictions, we have done so copiously. In other words, in this new digital environment, journalism and WikiLeaks continues to do what journalism has always done, reveal information that is in the public interest in an accurate, timely and responsible fashion. And WikiLeaks and Julian Assange ticks all those boxes. So what it boils down to is this. The criminalisation of information and those who seek to make information public in a century where technology allows and democracy demands that information be free. Now, in November last year, uh, Julian Assange got in touch with the Media Alliance to explain that he might have trouble paying his union dues because, for some reason, his credit cards had been made inoperable and his bank accounts had been frozen. In those extraordinary circumstances, we believe that uh, we would waive his union dues for a time. And so now I'd like to present his Australian lawyer, Rob Starry, with Julian's union card and ask Rob to ensure that Julian receives it to confirm that Julian Assange remains a journalist member in good standing of his union, the Media Alliance.